back. And now, Professor Asaf Hamdani, who needs no introduction except mentioning that he was my student. So we have three generations here. Okay. Uh, good afternoon. I would like to thank Zohar for inviting me to speak here at the, you know, this annual conference. I think it's a great uh, tradition. Uh, I'm going to talk about a paper uh, that actually started as a, you know, my dean is not here, right? I started as a consulting project. And, and it's kind of a weird consulting project, or it's kind of a weird paper to come out of a consulting project because I was hired uh, by one company in Israel to kind of to try to uh, change the recommendations of the committee uh, dealing with concentration of economic power. I don't know how to call it in English, the Recusiut Committee. And uh, my co-author was then the advisor to that committee. And, and we started, kind of after the committee completed its work, we started fighting over the expert opinion and we decided why not create a paper out of it. Now, it, it does not stop here because I was hired by the same company that hired Ron Gilson and Ellen Schwartz in the same case. And nevertheless, we found a way to, at least at some point, to show that their paper that came out of their opinion maybe missed one point that we're going to address just to make it interesting. Uh, okay, so the committee dealt with the Israeli approach to business groups. Uh, business groups, you know, uh, uh, companies, that uh, control other companies. Um, think about Samsung, for example. Okay, and this is a chart of Samsung. We, we kind of think about the fact that most companies around the world have controlling shareholders, but most companies or most countries around the world, it's not just a standalone firm with a controlling shareholder, it's, it's a business group, something that in the United States is less uh, uh, prevalent. And when I uh, wanted to write or was asked to write, one of the things that I started thinking about is our business groups, and you know, the Samsung example is just too complicated to work with, our business groups, like other forms of ownership structures where you can create a wedge between cash flow rights and voting rights. And the traditional view within the literature, and that uh, also was the view of the committee, that let's say that we focus on you know, the, the highlighted one down there at the left, the real estate company, what we really care about in terms of investor protection is the fact that there is a wedge. Now, I don't think that this, world is, this word has made it into Delaware case law, but it nearly made it into the Israeli law. The word is par, chevrot par. It's all about the wedge between cash flow and voting rights. Now, if you do the math uh, uh, quickly, you see that the same wedge exists with respect to both companies. This one here, you know, this is not, under our definition, this is not a business group. There are no uh, businesses owned by the same controlling shareholders. There's only one cash producing business, and that's the real estate business here. And this, on the left side, is a you know, uh, small version of Samsung. Business group pyramid uh, with many different type of businesses. And the question is, you know, academic literature tells us that what's important here is the difference between cash flow and voting rights. Is that really all that matters? And, and we believe that's not the case. And specifically, our point is that once you have more than one business under uh, the control of the same entity or the same person, that creates both the motive and the opportunity for uh, uh, specific forms of tunneling and you know, this is an, uh, uh, another academic word, specific forms of tunneling that do not fit within the traditional definition of self-dealing. This is one claim, and another claim that's slightly, or maybe uh, more so stronger than that, is that it cannot be regulated with existing uh, self-dealing measures. And the implications are business groups uh, are unlike pyramids and dual class firms. You know, they present their own investor protection concerns. Uh, for academics, especially economists, who, who try to focus on the wedge between cash flow and voting rights, this is just, maybe it is a proxy for agency costs, but it's incomplete proxy. And maybe anti-self-dealing rules are not necessarily sufficient. Now, this is the traditional view about share controlling shareholders. We know that controlling shareholders have uh, both the incentive and the power to monitor management. On the other hand, 
The trade-off is that they may engage in tunneling or self-dealing transactions, and that's why, uh, uh, if you wanted to summarize corporate law for controlling shareholders in one sentence, it's all about regulating self-dealing transactions. That consists of two steps. First, you have to identify what's a self-dealing transaction, and then you can adopt uh, a variety of measures to deal with that self-dealing transaction, either ex-ante uh, majority of minority votes, independent directors, or uh, some form of judicial review like the Delaware Entire Fairness Standard. And in fact, uh, the academic literature so far looks at this transactional approach or the regulation of self-dealing as both a necessary condition for minority protection and a sufficient condition. It's a necessary condition, and this is an example from a very influential study by financial economists. They wanted to rank the quality of investor protection rules across countries, so this set up a very plain vanilla self-dealing transactions transaction and asked countries around the world how do they protect controlling minority shareholders against that transaction, and based on that, view they ranked uh, uh, the different countries. And this is the point uh, from uh, Ron's paper stemming out of the same expert opinion. Uh, many people, many scholars believe that this is also a sufficient condition. That is, if you have good uh, rules that deal with self-dealing transactions, then you don't need to worry about uh, uh, other issues like structural remedies against uh, uh, business groups and pyramids and so on. And, again, our, our project argues that if it is a business group, that is under the assumption that there are more than one businesses controlled by the same person or entity, you might end up with what we label here, for the lack of a better name, indirect tunneling. So this is the basic setup that we had in mind, and, and what I'm going to do here is present several examples of how this works. We are concerned about other uh, businesses affiliated with it, and let's assume that we want to focus on what's going on at, I'm a minority shareholder at, you know, the publicly traded company, and, uh, and the concern is, am I being, uh, uh, am I being exploited by the controlling shareholder? And in the paper, we provide, or we describe three channels that could be used to divert value from that publicly traded company to the controller without engaging in any self-dealing transactions. Let's start with one example. I won't have the time to deal with all three, just two to demonstrate what we mean. Let's assume that there is some activity uh, that one of the companies in the group could take that could benefit, could benefit other members of that group. And one can think of several examples. Uh, for example, uh, you know, incurring the cost uh, uh, of required to maintain good contact with politicians, making donations, for example, or buying, buying control over a newspaper. And there are other examples that one could think of. And the point here, the point here is that the cost, the cost uh, is being paid by the publicly traded company, while the benefits, while the benefits of that activity or that acquisition or that transaction, even if some of them uh, are incurred by that publicly traded company, those benefits could also flow to other members of the group. Again, think about a newspaper. Uh, I buy a newspaper because it helps me you know, uh, uh, gain the political uh, influence. It's good for all the businesses in the group. But the question is, who pays for the cost of doing that? And there are examples that we mentioned in the paper in the world that you look at, well, we know, and Ron has written about it, that most media outlets in the world are owned by controlling shareholders. One explanation is the non-pecuniary non private benefits. But another explanation that not, doesn't necessarily conflict with that explanation is that, you know, this can be very uh, valuable for the business empire of the controlling shareholder. Now, if you look at examples around the world, you see that if you do have a business group that controls a newspaper, unlike the New York Times, for example, that's a standalone entity, usually the newspaper will be owned somewhere 
you know, by the companies at the lower tier of the pyramid. This is an example from Italy. One could think of examples from Israel, but you know why uh, uh, mention examples here? The La Repubblica newspaper is owned by one of the businesses, one of the companies, uh, the lower tier of the Benedetti family pyramid. Um, so what's going on here? From an economic standpoint, there is some sort of tunneling because all of the costs are being borne by uh, one company within the group, while the benefits, while the benefits flow to other uh, members of other companies. In theory, one could think of cost sharing agreements, you know, if, if, if one really wanted to play it fair. There's no self-dealing here, at least not under the conventional view. I mean, even if I do manage to, if, if, you, if you are convinced that there are benefits that flow to other members of the group, there's no transaction, there's no transaction that could be, that takes place between the controller and any of the companies in the group. Some people here, I know there's no question, which I think is a bad thing for presenters, but some people probably hear, well, what, what about just make self-dealing rules tighter? I'm going to address that later on. Uh, the other example, which again might seem familiar to some people here, but let's say, let's say that uh, one group, firm A2 in this example, uh, really needs cash, really needs cash. Um, and it decides to raise money from the public. Nobody really from, uh, uh, wants to make that investment. But then there is, a, you know, let's say an underwriter that says, you know, I'm willing to make that investment, but that underwriter makes that investment perhaps with the expectation that sometime in the future, sometime in the future, uh, you know, PTC would reward would reward uh, 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 the underwriter from helping the group in bad times. Again, this is an example, if, if the second stage really takes place, if the second stage really takes place, then maybe you know, the publicly traded company wouldn't have uh, uh, contracted with that underwriter to begin with, maybe it would be under different terms, but now there's informal exchange of favors. Um, how much time do I have? Seven and a half minutes. Okay. Um, I won't discuss. I won't discuss uh, uh, the taking of opportunities, although this is actually the case where there is evidence, empirical evidence, that that takes place in large business groups. Um, so we have. You know, what I did so far is basically to explain that, you know, there are ways in a large business group where. Uh, the controlling shareholder could divert value from one group firm to another group firm uh, without uh, engaging in any self-dealing. Uh, this is a problem from investor protection perspective because if I'm a minority shareholder at that uh, uh, group, uh, that company, then uh, uh, you know, I may be exploited. This could also create efficiency costs because more and more transactions take place not at arm's length. Uh, that's also an issue. And again, that's not, that's not self-dealing. Now, uh, one could say, and we agree with that claim, well, you just described kind of a more sophisticated version of self-dealing. And, and that's precisely correct. But, but, so why not, why not enhance enforcement, make it, you know, change the definitions of self-dealing, make it tighter to ensure that we capture, to ensure that we capture all of those kind of more sophisticated second generation forms of, of, of tunneling. And, and we think, and this is the stronger claim, that this is something that maybe could be done on the margin, but at some point it's just not feasible. And it's not feasible because the cost, because the costs are going to be too high, and the costs are going to be too high along two dimensions. One dimension is the direct cost, right? How do I regulate this type of transactions? I hire more independent directors, more auditors. I try to make sure that there is, you know, going back to the underwriting example, that the company is really uh, uh, has information about all the transactions that the controlling shareholder has, has done in the past with any business partners and so on. So these are the direct costs. Uh, but we are less concerned about the direct costs. We think that at some point, at some point, you know, the, the larger the problem becomes, the larger the problem becomes, you can't really, you can't really deal with that uh, problem without 
uh, interfering with something that at least Zohar and I think is very important, and that's what we explain in another paper, without actually taking management rights away from the controlling shareholders. Because, you know, if, if, if I get to a position where I think that, well, maybe that transaction, it looks like a traditional business transaction, but I really want to look into the motive and see, me, see, me, see maybe this is some sort of a payment for a favor that was done to another company, or see maybe this med newspaper that we're buying will actually provide benefits to other group members. At some point, you really can't do that without you know, giving the away or getting rid of the business judgment rules and controller management rights. So, uh, uh, what does this all mean first for academics, right? Uh, the first point is that the wedge, right, uh, not all wedges were created equal. The wedge between uh, 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 cash flow and voting rights is not all that matters. Again, going back to the slide, this, my second slide, it may be the case that we have two companies. In each of those companies, there is the same difference between the controller's cash flow rights and voting rights. Nevertheless, the concern as far as investor protection is, 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 is important to us. The concern is not necessarily the same. And maybe if Vevchak were here and wanted to relate to what Zohar said, he would have said, well, the paper that I wrote with Rene and Triantis in 2000 explaining why they're all substitutes is maybe not completely wrong, but to some extent there's something that, that we've missed. I'm not sure that he would present it this way, but he's not here. Um, and that's important because, again, there are many empirical studies that look at the wedge and only the wedge as kind of the measure for agency cost, and, and we explain why that is not necessarily complete. Instead, we think that other businesses affiliated, other business affiliated with the controlling shareholders could uh, uh, be important in that context. The more businesses you control, the more channels there are for indirect tunneling. And that's why Samsung and Google are different. Google, if, if you know, those of you who are unfamiliar with that, and again, this is another difference with, you know, from Ron, Google is much, Android is much better than iPhone. But other than that, Google is a dual class, the dual class company. It's now, I think it's triple class company because they ran out of their uh, 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 shares. So Google, assuming there's one business, Google, assuming there's one business with one con two controlling shareholders that have a wage between cash flow and control rights, is not, does not present the same corporate governance problem as Samsung with its complex ownership structure. And, uh, uh, and that goes back perhaps to the Israeli experience. You know, this shows we believe that anti-self-dealing rules may be uh, necessary, but sometimes may not be uh, uh, sufficient. You know, at some point, if you have large, complex uh, uh, business groups uh, and other conditions that we elaborate on in the paper, maybe anti-self-dealing rules could be somewhat ineffective. And that again, that again raises the question, and, and we just raise that as a question, what's the point where you really think that structural reforms uh, are actually uh, uh, warranted? Thank you very much. Thank you.